Okay, so this is going to be your VTS discussion for week seven. And let's see. <clears throat> you should have your little cutout that you got from class. A few of y'all left before I remembered to do it. And um, I sent them with somebody, so hopefully y'all got them. If not, leave a space for it. This is what the cutout should look like. And we're going to do a little bit of examination first. Uh, for your v VTS discussion, just the visual details part, which is the first part. So make sure you have your VTS student discussion notes page out so we can fill that out. Um, what we're going to notice first is that this is made of geometric shapes and that there are uh, specific colors. These are the primary colors. Okay, we have red, blue, and yellow. And we also notice that it's divided each color section is divided by these dark, these thick lines, right? They're heavily weighted, that's what we call them. And um, none of the colors are touching each other, right? So they're only, they're only here through this, uh, through the diagonal area. This one's completely separated. So there's not a lot of visual, uh, visual things that we're gonna notice about this. Um, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven square spaces. Okay, that could be another one. So anyway, those are a few of your uh, visuals that you can write down. If you need to pause it, you can. Otherwise, we are going to keep going. Oh, also, if you notice, there's some cracking up here too on the artwork. Or you can see it mostly in the white. Okay, so this is called composition number two. You can either put the Roman numeral 2 or just the number 2, either one. And it is by Pete Mondrian. And it was completed in 1930. So not too long ago did he make this one. And um, so this is a relatively new artist um, as far as artwork goes. This rather plain and simple piece of artwork was created by a man named Pete Mondrian. It is called composition number 2 or also composition with red, blue, and yellow. His full name was Pieter Cornelius Mondrian with two A's, but they he kind of changed that. For some reason, people ended up changing their names as they got older for some reason. So his name went on through a few changes, uh, went through a few changes as time went on, but let's start from the beginning. And of course, here's a self-portrait. This is a, a regular picture you can find off the internet of him. Mondrian was born on March 7th, 1872, in Armsfurt, Netherlands. As a young boy, he was introduced to art, and his father was a drawing teacher. Young Pete often spent time drawing next to the River Geen. I'm, I'm just guessing that's how you say that. Depicting scenes from his homeland. He was a Protestant, had a strict upbringing, and in 1892, he entered an academy in Amsterdam and qualified as a teacher for primary education. Okay, so here's some pictures of where he grew up and what it might have looked like uh, in the area. This is the river that he sat by a lot of time and uh, did his drawings and stuff. Uh, but he became an educational teacher at first. During this time, he still painted on the side. Most of his artwork didn't look like it does now. The little square piece, this is what he started out with, stuff like this. So it looks a lot different. And we're going to see what actually took place to uh, move him toward painting how he did. So at first, artwork was mostly of nature, landscapes, and vegetation of his native country. Some were realistic, while this is a little more realistic, this is a little, little more representational which shows how he was influenced by the artistic movements of his time, including pointillism and the vivid colored of, colors of Fauvism. So naturally, the movements of art that was going on at that time influenced some of the stuff that he did. Here's a couple of more things that he did. You notice that his style varies. He did this, and he also did these other ones that looked a lot more realistic. Uh, here's some more. And if you notice, these are some of the primary colors again and uh, some of the red blues and yellows okay so let's move on in 1911 um, he moved to Paris 
and changed the spelling of his name to emphasize his departure from the Netherlands. So that's one of the reasons why he changed his name. While in Paris, he immediately fell in love with the Cubist style of Pablo Picasso and Georges Borac. And that influence appeared almost immediately in his artwork. The above artwork was completed around 1910 before his move. The bottom was completed in 1911, the same year he moved to Paris. So how does his artwork change here? We go from this to this. This is very realistic. And you can start seeing here that he's doing a little more abstract art. So the branches are more set in a geometric fashion instead of just being naturally drawn. And that's just the change that happened in one year. So here is Picasso's artwork over here. And Mondrian kind of started looking at his artwork. And you can tell, look what's happening to his. Okay, he's taking on some of this geometric artwork technique here and doing some of the cubism and stuff and uh, abstractness. And he's adding that to this. So definitely to this one for sure. We can definitely see the influence. Here's 1911, 1912, 1913, and then 1914. And we see how dramatically this changed in just a few years. So as you can see, Pete Mondrian seems to be progressing towards simplicity, right? This is super simple compared to this over here. We see him using less and less of the elements in his artwork. So he's really reducing this down to just shapes, lines, and colors. Whereas this one uses values and, and um, all, all sorts of different things over here. So what elements do you see that he abandoned by 1914? All right, we just kind of talked about that. So he definitely is abandoning, abandoning a lot of the elements of art but we'll see why here in a little bit. But Picasso wasn't the only artist uh, Pete admired. Uh, he also admired the artistic theories of Russian artist Wassily Kins, uh, Kins, Kinsky, sorry, who was known as the first purely abstract painter. Okay, so you might remember this guy. We're gonna probably look at his artwork at another time. Uh, he was a believer in the commutative power of line, just uh, communicative, sorry, power of line, meaning it can communicate to a person, just as Kinsky was. But Pete disregard, disagreed with Kinsky and believed the range of elements should be reduced even farther to even a purer state. So this is some of the stuff that um, Kandinsky did right here, just using basic lines and, and colors and shapes, just these basic elements. But Pete Though, although he liked this, he wasn't completely happy with it. and He wanted to make it more simple. So what caused him to pursue such simplicity? Was it just from what he saw in the artwork of others? No. It was, he was not satisfied with the simplicity of cubism, uh, like the cubists were, but the abstract, or the abstract originality of Kandinsky, because he was still attempting to reconcile his painting with his spiritual pursuits. So this guy, his, his painting was almost like a spiritual thing to him. So as a theoretician of art, he treated art like a natural phenomenon, like, like we would treat gravity. And we were trying to find the basic, basic, basic elements of gravity and the basic theory of gravity. So he sought to investigate it like any other natural occurrence, almost like breaking down a substance to its atomic level. This led Pete to have almost a spiritual approach to his artwork, as if he was trying to unlock the mysteries of the artistic universe through unveiling the purest atoms of art. So this guy was really, really into this. So he decided to visit the Netherlands again, back to where he originally came from, in 1914. But while he was there, World War I began, and it forced him to stay a lot longer than he planned, so he kind of got stuck there. And he stayed with an artist colony and met a man who further developed his way of thinking. The man only used primary colors in his art. And Mondrian was sure this more precise method 
was his path to take on his journey of art artistic purity. So he's like, aha, this guy's on to something. This is the way I need to go. So with this man's help, Pete founded De Stiel Group, which is the style group. And I, know, I know I'm not pronouncing that correctly. And a journal was published, uh, which published his first theories about what he called neoplasticism. That's not plastic. Uh, we'll talk about that. And uh, neoplasticism was born. And this is, this is his little flyer there. So, what is neoplasticism? At the time, people referred to painting and sculpture as the plastic arts to distinguish them from written art forms like music and literature. The term plastic referred not to the material, though plastic was uh, in existence at that time, but rather it referred to plasticity, the condition of stuff that can be formed in other stuff, which is pretty much what that means. When Pete coined the term neoplasticism for his art movement in 1917, it was a rejection of the plasticity of the past and signified the new art. He felt, which is why the neo is in front of it, so he felt that the new art should be one of limitations, reducing artistic language to only what was most essential. In the image, you see his partner, right up here, and the words which indicate the influence of the style of the movement spread further that the style spread further than just to painting as we will see later this is architectural style of neoplasticism so this was even used in architecture and we'll see that in a little while so due to his newfound art form in 1917 his style began to change more and more he began to remove all lines except vertical and horizontal lines see how that can lead up to what we were looking at at the beginning so he removed everything but those type of lines from his art and began to use very specific colors. So here's 1917, 1918, 1919, again in 1919. So he's, he's definitely moving toward what we were looking at. This has a lot more squares, I mean rectangular pieces than what we saw at our original piece. So we're moving up to that. So why specifically do you think Mondrian got rid of diagonal lines at this point? So can't really discuss that amongst herself. This is kind of designed for a group. But uh, anyway, that's something you could think about. Why do you think he got rid of diagonal lines at this point? Um, here's the answer. Because diagonal lines were used in perspective, right? When we do perspective... Um, we want to draw those orthogonal lines that shows like when we're drawing a, a road or something and they're diagonal. They help with making things three-dimensional. So Mondrian rejected diagonal lines because he wanted to avoid perspective and gain a completely flat surface. He wanted something pure and universal. He believed vertical lines, when used together, represented the pure essential opposing forces of the universe, similar to good and evil. So I guess because... They, they went up and down, right? Uh, and then horizontal lines. So anyway, so he wanted just those simple, simple lines like that. So he expressed his earlier thoughts about this idea that weren't yet into practice and how he created art in a letter to a friend he wrote several years before in 1914, just before his big transition in style. So this is what he wrote in a letter to one of his friends. He said, I construct lines and color combinations on a flat surface in order to express general beauty with the utmost awareness. Nature, or that which I see, inspires me, puts me, as with any painter, in an emotional state so that an urge comes about to make something. But I want to come as close as possible to the truth and abstract everything from that until I reach the foundation still just an external foundation of things i believe it is possible that through horizontal and vertical lines constructed with awareness but not with calculation led by high intuition that means you're going to not do it uh, like mathematically but you're going to do it from the inside and brought to harmony and rhythm these basic forms of beauty supplemented if necessary by other direct lines or curves can become a work of art as strong as it is true so he was really passionate about this stuff what he was doing he was serious here 
So in the first grid style paintings that he did, they consisted of thin gray lines outlining rectangular forms. Yes, they were gray at first, not black. The lines also tended to fade as they approached the edge of the painting rather than stopping abruptly. The forms themselves were smaller and more numerous than the paintings he created later. And yes, uh, somebody went through and examined all of his artwork to this detail to figure out things like the line faded before it got to the very end. So somebody has to have that job, right? <laughs> so like the one we're focusing on today, uh, and nearly all the spaces were filled with a primary color. All right. So when the war ended in 1918, Mondrian returned to France and stayed there until 1938. During this time period, he fully embraced the art of pure abstraction for the rest of his life. He did produce a few normal paintings, though, but for the most part, it was purely abstract. He totally embraced that. His grid-style paintings and neoplasticism form of art didn't truly begin to take off until it was the late 1919 and 1920s. So this is the style he is most recognized for, such as composition number two, which is what one of the ones we're looking at. Um, during the 1920s and 1921, during those years, his painting, paintings arrived at their fully mature form. The lines became black rather than gray, and more often than not, they were made thicker than before. The forms spaces are now larger and less in number, for the most part, and more of the forms are left uncolored. He began to really favor white space, whereas before he didn't. So he was really liking the white stuff at this point. And he also began to paint lines that extended to the edge of the canvas instead of fading, giving the illusion that the piece was only part of a larger piece of artwork. So, in composition number two, this is the one that we're doing. Upon close examination, one could see clues of the artist's painting method. And here's some information for your VTS discussion. This is an oil. Some say oil and paper, uh, but it's oil on canvas. The colored planes are not perfectly flat, but rather brush strokes are clear and evident in each section. Pete Mondrian seems to have used different techniques for each part. The black lines are the flattest elements on the artwork and have the least amount of depth. The colored forms have the most obvious brush strokes running in all directions. The white forms, though, seem to have been painted in layers. And that's kind of probably why the white ones are cracking more, because they have the layers. This generates a greater sense of depth than the white forms, so that they appear to overwhelm the lines and the colors. White did indeed dominate as it became his most favorite space. So here's just a, just a close-up. Okay, so Mondrian was soon esteemed as one of the great artists alongside Rembrandt and Van Gogh. Even though he just painted squares. Anyway, but he was the first one to do it, so that's what makes it important. <laughs> so his artwork continued to be displayed at various places, and he gained fame for his new style. So let's look at his evolution here while he lived in France. This is from 1918 to 1938. Okay, so let's look at the changes that happened. Okay, so in 1921, we go from there, 1922, 23, 24, he's kind of jumping around a little bit. Now here we go, we can see a huge difference. Now he's really going to the white squares in 30, 31, 35, and 36. And then suddenly we get to 37, and he just kind of goes crazy with the black lines right he's getting all sorts of black lines now and the color is still very minimal but he's got a lot of white spaces way more white spaces than colored so in 1938 he left Paris and went to London but when in Paris but when Paris fell in 1940 he left London for Manhattan and there was a delay in some of his artwork being finished okay because he had to do this traveling uh, during this time due to traveling and moving around so some of his artwork in this time period takes up a span of two or three years instead of just a single year. That's why it kind of jumps with the dates. So here's some of his last stuff. His artwork that he completed during this time was much more busy than his previous pieces. So remember, he's in Manhattan and stuff now. He's over, over in America. 
Um, he began to produce pieces that were unbound by black lines, and they were full of color. The top piece up here is titled New York City One and was made in 1942. The bottom was made in 1942 and 1944, and it's called Victory Boogie Woogie. And we see this is pretty, feels very busy. But this he didn't paint. He created lines from small pieces of rectangular colored shimmering tape. And it reflects the upbeat music of the city he now lived in. You can see New York. This is probably reminds him of the, the streets, lights as the colors. You know, you know when you look at a, at a picture that's taken of a city and you see all these red lights going one way and yellow lights going another. That might be something that he's kind of thinking of in this one. So uh, perhaps the top piece reminded him of that. Uh, the bottom piece reminds us of a busy event, maybe dancing and music of Broadway's. So uh, this piece was very carefully completed. Here's all the little bitty pieces of tape that he did. I mean, that's just a little bitty. Even this, there's like one, two, three right here. One, two, three here. There's two. He took a lot of time putting this together. <laughs> I don't know how big this is, but hopefully it's not too tiny because I couldn't imagine making itty bitty pieces of tape like that. So, so here they use 1942, and then there's the boogie woogie one, 1944. So, here's the end. We made it! Yay! Okay, so Pete Mondrian died soon after hit uh, after after this, after he did these last few pieces in Manhattan and New York. He died of pneumonia. On February 1st, 1944. So write that down. That's his time of death. Or day of death. And he was buried at Cypress Hill Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. Here's the cemetery entrance. Very pretty. They held a memorial a few days later at the Universal Chapel on Lexington Avenue. And nearly 200 people attended. The Mondrian Holtzman Trust Fund uh, still functions as Mondrian's official state estate which its goal is to promote awareness of his artwork and ensure the integrity of his work. And years after his death, his artistic style branched off into fashion. Here are some images of the Mondrian dresses right here. And uh, this also we have some shoes and some uh, even furniture. I don't know what this little bitty furniture is about. But uh, you've maybe seen some Mondrian, uh, modern day designs on purses, clothing, and even architecture that still borrow these things from Pete Mondrian's theory of art. So this could also be something that you play with when you do your, um, uh, the other side of your art a &E, your appreciation, um, I mean the exploration part, uh, or experimentation, sorry, I'm going to get the right word eventually. So you could experiment with this. You could, if you're, if you are into doing some clothing, you could maybe design some clothes with this style. Or maybe if you want to do an architecture, you could make some simple architecture uh, with this. You can even look online if you wanted to to check that out. So uh, to end with, we could only hope that he also pursued simplicit, uh, the simplicity purity before God and Christ with such vigor as he did his art. But there's very little found out about the happenings of his spiritual life or any pursuit of God, aside from his strict upbringing as a child. So we don't really know anything about his religious uh, side, except hopefully he pursued that too, but we don't know. It would be a sad thing to devote one's life to discovering the hidden spirituality and purity of art in this life, but forsake true spirituality and atonement for eternity that is plainly offered to us. So let us not seek to gain the treasures of the world and yet all the while be distracted from the true everlasting treasure. And hopefully Pete was not one of those people, but I guess we will know eventually. I hope that you enjoyed this uh, art a and &E. I know it was a little bit long, about 25 minutes almost, but um, hopefully you got everything written down and you got some ideas to do for your experimentation side also. So go ahead and glue your um, your picture down, get your uh, other side laid out how you want it, and then later this week you can complete the rest of it. And that should be all you have other than your observational sketch and your vocabulary. Remember, observational sketch, just do a sketch. All right, we'll see you Tuesday. Bye.